Fellow at the Institute of Commonwealth um, Studies and acclaimed author of The Black Tudors, The Untold Story. Um, so Miranda's book was shortlisted. Yes, very good. <laughs> Miranda's book was shortlisted for the prestigious Wolfson History Prize and the Nayaf L. Rodham Prize. Um, the exciting news is that the Black Tudors is also being used as a basis and inspiration for a new TV drama, um, Southwark for BritBox TV. And she's currently working or researching her next book, The Heiress, The Caribbean Marriage Trade. So as well as uh, an author, Miranda is also a freelance historian and journalist and has worked for a range of organizations and media outlets, including the Sunday Times, the National Trust, English Heritage, and the BBC. Miranda has been consulted in the making of many programs, including the BAFTA award-winning BBC Two series with David Alasoga, Black, British, and a Forgotten History. Um, and so this, this is an opportunity for us to really broaden our understanding of the history and contributions made by people who have effectively been airbrushed out of history. Um, and Miranda brings these voices alive through her research and writing. And I must say that I'm pleased that this event is happening outside of Black History Month. And that's a hopeful signal that we um, need to have not limit our discussions uh, around Black history to a single month of the year. So I'm sure that there will be many questions that we'll have um, for Amanda. Uh, and I, I will be handing over to Ella to sort of, you know, make sure we are capturing all of the questions as well during the question and answer event. Um, but before I do, may I ask you, Miranda, just to set the scene for us and maybe talk about what sort of spurred you to embark on this exciting project. Now, again, in the, the, the YouTube video that we've seen, you've talked about this a bit, but I think it'd be useful for you to set the scene for, for the group today. Sure. Um, so I suppose I, I came to the subject uh, as you know, sort of as an undergraduate when I was trying to decide what to continue studying because um, I knew I loved history and I knew I wanted to do more, but I had to find something to investigate um, for my master's and then my doctorate. Uh, and uh, I think I, I'd always loved the Tudors, um, but I was I was in an early modern uh, lecture about early modern trade and the lecturer it was fairly dull but then I suddenly pricked up me my ears when the lecturer suddenly said that the Tudors had started trading to Africa in the middle of the 16th century um which was news to me and then you know I had it sort of came took it went took off from there really you know I went to the library and started trying to find out more and um you know back in the days before Google I don't think I even had a laptop anyway uh, <laughs> this is sort of in 2004 uh, and uh, I, you know, I, I, guess I came across some of the kind of classic um, black, uh, black British history titles like Peter Fry. I just happened to have him on my desk. I didn't prepare this. But anyway, Peter Fry's Staying Power, um, which has a couple of pages at the beginning about the Tudor period, but a lot of it covers sort of the 18th century onwards. Uh, and then, you know, in Peter Fry, it mentions that... Um, that there were Africans in the period time of, of Queen Elizabeth I. And, you know, again, it was this jolt of like, oh, well, not only were we trading with Africa sort of 200 years earlier than traditionally we're taught about at school with the transatlantic slave trade and the, um, sorry, I mean to say trafficking in enslaved Africans. And I think that the language is important there, uh, which you can ask me about later if you like. But the, um, uh, what was I say? So, so uh, not only was uh, contact with Africa happening a lot earlier than I thought, and actually that 16th century contact is very much more trading in uh, you know other commodities like gold, melagrassa pepper, ivory. Um, but that actual black presence goes back in this country so much further back than again that than we're often um, told. So, I, yeah, I just wanted to find out more. And there wasn't a lot in the published literature at the time for this period. And I just started digging and went into the archives, you know, with the guidance of my tutors into, you know, what early modern archives there were out there. Um, I got some initial really 
important help for me from Marika Sherwood and Kathy Chater, who were both members of the Black and Asian Studies Association. And they had kind of been collecting these references as well. And they found a lot, particularly from parish registers, um, of, you know, entries of baptisms and burials and some marriages. Uh, and I kind of just took it from there, really. And um, I ended up finding kind of over 400 references to Africans in Britain between 1500 and 1640. Uh, and that was the basis of my thesis um, when I wrote about, uh, you know, kind of thematic things like what, you know, what was the context? What, how did these people come to Britain and why? How were they treated here? What were their experiences in terms of working life, in terms of their personal lives and their religious lives? Uh, and whether they were enslaved or not. And I I, found, I, I concluded that they, they were not legally enslaved in Britain at that time, which was kind of one of my major conclusions. But then I didn't want to leave that, you know, lodged in the library as my PhD. I wanted to tell the world. So that's why I wrote Black Judas. Wow, that's that's it, it, amazing. I mean, it's just, just, you know, personal curiosity really spurring you on i mean I, let's let's pick up that bit about the the language you said you know because i use the the term transatlantic slave trade but you want to unpick you you were saying that it's about about trafficking could you yeah so that's not i mean this is not an original thought of mine at all i'm kind of picking up on uh, broader discussions amongst um scholars of enslavement and um, I don't know if you've heard people beginning to use the word enslaved, you know, enslaved people, as opposed to talking about slaves um, mm -hmm. and kind of talking about uh, the, what some people, you might call it the trade in enslaved people. But I think using the word trafficking uh, kind of uh, reflects, you know, the, the kind of Im immorality of what was happening better than saying trade, because trade seems like a, you know, a legal and reasonable thing to be doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, it was officially, you know, legal at the time in terms of British law or whatever, in terms of kind of, uh, you know, uh, you know, you won't want to be talking about the trade in slaves in, uh, in an interchangeable way as to talking about the trade in coffee or sugar or, you know, you don't want to reduce people into commodities by reproducing the language of the enslavers at the time. And I think, you know, this is a language that's still evolving and some of the neologisms are a bit clunky and it can be, you know, and that's why I trip myself up as well still, because I've been used to using, you know, that old uh, terminology, you know, earlier in my, in my career, but now I'm really consciously trying to make an effort to think about it. And I've actually been in a couple of workshops now and discussions about language and how we need to create a new language, I think, in order to discuss these issues sensitively um more sensitively um, yeah okay so and again so that's looking at it through you know you, a, a modern more human prison prism because again if you were to do research for example Lloyds of London when they insured the cargo on that ship they would look at it as a commodity and therefore it would be it would unfortunately the, the human cargo would be similar to any any other commodity that's trade but again that's through the prism of that time okay I, I think it's also a marker to remind us of personhood like to give okay. people that respect um you know if someone you know, it's kind of like there's a discussion about yeah you know, this is where you know calling calling someone talking about enslaved people or enslaved africans or enslaved man enslaved woman instead of talking about slaves you're kind of remind it's a, a linguistic marker that these people have been enslaved. It's something that was done to them and it's not their whole um, identity. OK, OK. All right. Great. All right. So I'm going to open it up to the, the floor. So again, as Ella pointed out, you could type in questions into the chat. Um, or you can use the hand raising uh, function and we'll try to decipher who's first then. Um, does anyone want to start? Hopefully you've had an opportunity to look at the um, the YouTube presentation, if not read the book. Uh, I've, I've got an opening question for okay. you. Okay. Um, and um, this has come through from, uh, well, it says anonymous on the form, so. <laughs> um, but. Um, 
I think, you know, giving an overview of what you've accomplished with uh, Black Tudors is, um, has been really interesting. Um, but there's been a couple of questions around um, what your plans are next as well. The, so to talk about perhaps your future plans. <laughs> um, well, it, it's not helpful when a lot of the archives are shut. But yeah. <laughs> um, uh, and um, I keep on slowing down because I'm doing events like this instead of working. Um, but this is work, right? Anyway, but uh, this is fun. But uh, no, I, I, my next book is a uh, working title, Heiresses, the Caribbean Marriage Trade. Uh, and I think it's as I'm researching that, that I've, I have been having, uh, you know, thinking more closely about the kind of language that we use. Um, uh, and that book is about uh, wi wi Brit British women who inherited fortunes from the Caribbean, from uh, the from slave plantations. Um, Sorry, there's another phrase you want to say. Sugar plantations worked by enslaved people and thus, you know, were bringing the profits uh, uh, of, of that enslaved labour into Britain. Um, they were heiresses, so they were marrying into British society uh, and bringing that money here. And so it's that it's uh, an interest. It's kind of uh, interesting to kind of look at their biographies, but at the same time sort of trace back what what enabled their kind of relatively lavish lifestyles and, uh, you know, how those connections work um, with um, you know, elements of British history that we don't always see as being connected with the Caribbean and with colonialism and enslavement that actually there were. Um, and, and I'm finding that really fascinating. I found kind of about over 150 women that sort of fit that general criteria, um, mostly using the legacies of British slave ownership database at UCL um, and, and adding to it, you know, supplementing that. But the book um, is going to be uh, based around 10 of those women, uh, sort of in the same way that, you know, in a similar structure to Black Tudors, because, yeah, I think, well, people seem to enjoy that structure. But, but you know, I think I think focusing in on individuals and in biography uh, you know, is, is, is a, an interesting way of looking at it. And surprisingly, um, with, with Black Tudors, you know, the 10 chapters, you know, kind of almost self-selected themselves because those were the individuals that it was possible to piece together some kind of biography for um, because as you can imagine the archival records of Black Tudors are quite scattered and sometimes quite fragmentary um, and I thought that by fast forwarding 200 years and writing about white women instead of Black people uh, it, it would be easier but actually there still isn't a huge amount of information about a lot of these women um, so it was actually again relatively easy to narrow down. I heard a kind of long list of twenty three, um, but uh, you know, I, I, I was. It was really important to me that there was as much archival material as possible, ideally written by them, which is again something um, that unfortunately with the Black Tudors we don't have that kind of first hand evidence um, yet. You never know what we might find next. I think. I think that's the other thing to say about the Black Tudors work is, you know, I, I I've written a book, but what I would love more than anything is um, for other scholars to, you know, pick up the the gauntlet and find more because I, I, I think, and, you know, and, and maybe draw different conclusions from the material that they find um, and continue that discussion of it. Um, another project I'm involved with at the moment is called Colonial Countryside, and that's working with the National Trust, creative writers and school children, sort of 10 year olds last year of primary school, uh, looking at uh, colonial uh, connections to uh, National Trust country houses, which you might have seen that kind of theme in the news has kind of uh, it's expanded and there's more happening in that in that field as well. Excellent. I mean, I see that Naomi has her hand up or is that no? Yeah. Hi, yes. Um, I just thought I would ask you if you've heard of a book by Stephanie E. Jones Rogers. It's called They Were Her Property, White okay. Women as Slave Owners in the American South. Mm -hmm. And it explores um, the agency that a lot of white women actually had during slavery. Like uh, the narratives in history is really how, as you know, like it was slave, slave owners were kind of controlled <laughs> mostly by men. And it was all it, they were the ones in control, but this book shows how women also had a lot of agency in slavery. They were there 
they were there um they they helped to buy slaves they were given slaves as part of their marriage so i don't know if that would be good for your second book but i just thought i would um just check that you've heard of it yeah i have a copy i have to confess i haven't read it yet i listened to her being interviewed about it uh, on a podcast and you're right yeah exactly it has a lot of really relevant themes uh, in in what she's done and you know it, as, as far as it's more it's uh, you know north american kind of more quite a lot of it material i think being 19th century as well yeah. um but yeah really important and i think part of uh you know part of that kind of you know to, to puncture that myth of like the good mistress or something you know mm -hmm. it's, you know the, the, you know to sort of it's almost a sort of feminist agenda isn't it but not in a kind of celebratory way yes, <laughs> to yes. kind of show that the power didn't just because again you mean in the same way you know if if i said the word slave owner or slaveholder you would imagine a man yes probably you know and certainly a lot of the literature uh has been written by men about men and uh i think yeah looking at the agency of of the women in the story um is vital and very interesting and i, I remember she was talking about um uh you know how some you know even as small children um you know young girls would be enslavers they would be given a person you know as their property yeah. as a child like as a christening present or something you know it's it's sort of so it's sort of part of their identity from a very early age um and, and i think that's really interesting and i think that's you know where looking at heiresses now um you know these women are bringing that wealth to the marriage even though officially uh you know the law of coverture meant that the woman's legal status was subsumed in under the husband's in in a marriage um you you can see that because you know they know that it's hers you know she still has this sense of proprietary proprietorial sense about that wealth and uh you know, and that comes through in conversations and kind of networks and um yeah but i'm sort of still fairly early on in the project it's been slowed down quite a lot this year by by covid and homeschooling and uh you know archives being shut and everything but there's a lot there's a lot to do um yeah so so yeah thank you that that book is on my radar but i need to spend more time with it yeah. tells us why digitization is so important as well the fact that you can't get access to these materials unless you're in a physical location um i see a question in the chat from um phil jones he's asking have you tried to track down any living descendants of any of the 10 black tutors that you focused on in the book yeah um just a question for you. Someone just texted me saying they'd like to be at this chat but can't get in because the registration's closed. Is it possible for them to get in now or is it all set up and finished kind of thing? I'll flag that over to Ella. <laughs> <laughs> Ella. Um, so. If they can email me at e.mitchell uh, at ul.ac.uk, I can send them the, the invite. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll sort that out. Right, sorry everybody. Um, so, uh, sorry. So, the, sorry. T tell me that question again. Uh, so, have you tried to track down any living descendants oh, of right. any of of the ten black tutors you focused on in the book? Yeah. Um, so, uh, well, the short answer is no. Um, I think. Uh, uh, no so so it's tricky um as well because a lot of these individuals you don't always have a surname even or like a whole uh, story so it can be hard um so it wasn't something that i spent a lot of time attempting but uh kind of while while in the swimming in these waters you know things float towards you so um uh there's a man called peter bluck who himself has traced his ancestry back to an african man called henry jetto uh, who died in uh, the early 17th century and as, as far as we know I think that was right mm. anyway it's in the book but uh, but as far as we know he's the first um, he's the first um, African to leave a will in in Britain uh, he's actually we've actually just got him an entry in the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography uh, written by Onye Kanubia I think who has also done a lot of work in this area um, and he Onyeka wrote about Peter Bluck in, in his book Blackamoors as well. 
um, uh, so 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 that that's at least one modern descendant. But I think um, part of the story, part of uh, my research found that you know that um, black Tudors were um, intermarrying and you know having extramarital relationships as well with with white British people, and so you know more of the people living in this country might have black Tudor ancestry than they know. You know, and I think that that's another really interesting. Uh, avenue you know I think I think I had a line in the conclusion of the book saying I want the entire country to do a DNA test uh, but my editor took it out because he thought it was too yeah, long. yeah that, that would have been pretty provocative <laughs> yeah, it's too provocative but I would love that to to happen um, and I think you know uh, there's so much interest in genealogy and family history um, and you know and it develops all the time and the science of the dna is you know which i don't pretend to understand you know is evolving so i think uh, there's no reason why you know more people might find that ancestry if they do the research okay all right so interesting question here from nia spencer she asks to what do you attribute your interest in humanizing black people as a black American, I'm always pleasantly surprised to encounter people who've avoided a wholehearted embrace of anti-black bias. And I'm curious how it happens. Um, it, it, uh, you, you may be able to see in the chat as well, Miranda, just in case. Yeah, sorry, um, that's quite a complex one. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, Nia, do you want to jump on and try to frame the question? You know, it might might make more sense. I'm sorry, I was chewing. Um, sure. Okay. I, we know about the implicit bias studies and tests that we're all able to take. And when I took mine, I found that I was one of maybe 6% of people, including black people, who don't embrace anti-black bias. I'm always pleasantly surprised when I encounter people who actually do take an interest in humanizing black people and sort of going against the popular narrative of slave as full identity um, that I you know, grew up witnessing in America, and who say, wait, this is really interesting. Let me dig deeper into the lives of black people outside of slavery. And I'm just curious if there's any particular aspect of your life to which you attribute the way that your mind works with regard to black people. Were you raised by explicitly anti-racist parents or is it more <laughs> a process of self-discovery or, you know. It's interesting, actually, because my dad said that he wanted to dial into this and listen today, but I don't see him on the chat because it would be really interesting to get him to answer that question. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think I'm slightly thankful that he's not here. <laughs> but, um, uh, I mean, that sounds like we should do a whole like psychology <laughs> session on my upbringing, but I, I don't, I, I don't, um, um, I, I, I think, I think it's, it's, I think it's actually quite scary to think that you find my, my, attitude somehow unusual I mean that's quite a scary worldview but unfortunately there are there do seem to be events happening in the world that kind of back that up and I but I mean I've I've read about you know I've tried to educate myself about um implicit bias explicit bias I've read this book called white fragility that you might know and I'm kind of halfway through Ibram Kendi's um book about how to be an anti-racist um and you know I have been having these conversations for a long time I think through entering the kind of black British history world um and um so I've tried to listen and learn um from people in that sphere I mean I suppose in terms of my upbringing I grew up in London so I grew up in a kind of multicultural world where I saw you know I mean it's a bit of a lame thing to say someone said this to me the other day and I do think it's a bit lame but like sort of I saw lots of different people on the tube <laughs> you know I wasn't kind of brought up in a monoculture um and we also did quite a lot of foreign travel when I was growing up um but I suppose I drew my own conclusions from what I saw um but uh I don't know I uh, yeah so I I I don't know if I'm answering the question um, very well. Um, well, it was quite interesting um, because in the in your um, YouTube 
presentation, you talked about, uh, you know, sort of uh, British history through a singular prism um, when you were in school and how you you were, you know, fascinated, you know, that there was this whole other story that hadn't been told and, and, and that spurred your curiosity as well. Yeah, um, I think, you know, I think um, with all the arrogance of a 21 year old, I thought I knew everything about the Tudors. <laughs> mm -hmm. I know, uh, I probably just said exactly what I said in the lecture. <laughs> I can't remember what I said. But um, yeah, uh, I, th I think that, um, I think that's a common theme in my work in general that, um, you know, I, I, you know, not hidden histories, but, but surpri you know, the surprising juxtapositions you know, we hear uh, the Tudors are probably like, a, you know, a, a part of British history that's got, you know, a, probably one of the most prominent parts of British history in terms of kind of in popular culture. Um, and yet, you know, none of us, you know, for, you know, apart from a small number of specialists, um, you know, uh, including, um, you know, scholars like on Nubia and MTS, but a long uh, tradition of black British history scholarship, you know, going back to to Peter Fryer, James Wolfe, you know, it goes back to the 70s at least, but um, apart from that small group of experts, the, you know, the rest of the world was, you know, was not really still completely aware of that. And I think, I think I've, that's, that's the joy of history for me is that you can always find something new if you ask new questions of the past. And it's not, I mean, you know, that there's been what's been sort of referred to as the culture wars going on at the moment. And, you know, people, you know, it's mostly, it seems to be right wing people who use that expression. Um, but I do feel like I'm a foot soldier in those <laughs> wars. But I think, um, you know, you have people saying that they're trying to rewrite our history or, you know, this kind of language. And, you know, rewriting history is my job description. Um, if history was a sort of monolithic set of facts to be ground into people's heads, like, in Dickens's hard times, then there would be no point in being a historian because there'd be nothing new to discover. There would be no point in setting foot in an archive because, you know, the story's already been written. But, uh, you know, I think the point of his, of being a historian is to, um, you know, um, interrogate the story you've been told and, and you know, see if it's true and, and, you know, learn more and ask different questions. And, um, Again, you know, I think these sort of harking back as well to um, the, the, the woman who mentioned Stephanie Jones Rogers um, changing the narrative, because I think I think a lot I came to the he the heiress's topic originally through my research into English heritage houses uh, back in sort of 2006, uh, seven in the kind of moment of the commemoration of the bicentenary of the abolition of the slave trade. There's another mouthful for you but um uh, you know, it, it was one of the sort of relatively hidden ways in which colonial wealth was coming into britain is through these marriages to heiresses because uh the standard narrative of one of these houses firstly mostly they talk about the furniture rather than the people who lived there quite often uh, uh and uh you know the furniture and the paintings and the architecture and all of that um but when they do talk about the family, it's the male line. It's like, this is the house of the Smith family. And they don't usually mention that, you know, Mr. Smith the third married a Miss Jones of Jamaica. And that's how they managed to build the East Wing um, because of that kind of patrilineal narrative. Well, it, it, what, I mean, I'll it, it, go to Ellen uh, uh, in a minute. Um because I'm sure there are other questions that have come through. But one thing that struck me with the imagery of, um, you know, some of the stories that, that you told, and again, going back to YouTube videos, they were always posed in these sort of the um, like British attire. And, he, and if they, in, in some cases, you had people who were sort of dignitaries from other countries or, or representatives from, I think there was one man from Cameroon um, that you talked about. It's, I, I found it, the, the dress that, you know, it was almost as if, you know, the, um, the images, is it just the artist likes likeness that, that, that had them in that particular garb? Why, why didn't I, we get a sense of them sort of, you know, dressed in attire from their own, you know, sort of countries, for example, it, it, it was just strange to me. 
Well, I should refer you to Michael Hajiru, who I think is now on the call. Uh, okay. He's an art historian who specialises in, in the image of, of the black, but um, he does tours of London galleries and mm -hmm. is really obsessed with John Blank and also the, the Black Magi figure. Mm -hmm. um, I think, yeah, I don't, it's not something I've looked into in detail. Um, and I do, I think that the image you're talking about was uh, an emissary from Congo to yeah, okay. the Dutch Republic. Um, I think, uh, I think, I think it's likely that those individuals would have been wearing those clothes at the time while that when they were moving through um you know the du the dutch world um mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because the climate <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. But, but no i mean there are um accounts of um i think i'm thinking of um an account of uh there's an interesting account that i quote in the book in the chapter on prince dedari jakawa who comes to london um in 1611 uh he's a prince from river sestos in uh, modern day liberia and uh it's not about him, but there are uh, there are references to I think some uh, some uh, Native Americans who are staying with Walter Raleigh, and uh, an observer mentions that the first time he met them they they weren't they weren't you know well clothed, but the next time he meets them they're wearing uh, you know, European dress, and he says you know they were they you know they seemed much more civilized or you know that that he, he you know I think dress. Dress was very important, you know, mm. still is today, perhaps, as an indicator of class and civility. You know, you have descriptions, when you have descriptions of sort of naked people, it's not usually very positive. No. And the, no. I'm trying to find the, the section in, in the book. Um, anyway, it's around, it's in the, yeah, around the, the, the yeah. Oh, here, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Clothes could make a big difference to the way foreign visitors were perceived. Page 187. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So this is actually earlier. In 1501, two men from Newfoundland appeared before Henry VII, clothed in beast skins and ate raw flesh, and spoke such speech that no man could understand them. Uh, in their demeanour, like to brute beasts. But within two years, they were seen at Westminster Palace, apparelled after Englishmen, so that the anonymous observer had to admit that he could not discern them from Englishmen until I learned what men they were. Um, and there's another story about Corrie the Saldanian from modern day South Africa, and they make him a suit of armour, I think, uh, out of uh, copper, I think, which is a metal that was sort of very valued there at the time. Um, and then they get annoyed because when he goes home, he tells his compatriots that copper isn't that expensive in London, and then they have to, you know, then <laughs> it messes up the bartering um system for the english you know the 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 uh the da you know that they there's this that these people are part of a trend where um africans were brought back to london um by merchants um taught english and then uh taken back to their native countries where they worked as interpreters and yeah the trick yeah 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 it's you can kind of understand a prep you know it's not again it's not the traditional narrative we're told about those kinds of interactions but it, you can see that that would be necessary in order to conduct trade um because you know otherwise they, how are they going to understand each other um and the power dynamic is a bit different again to what it becomes later because um uh you know the the, the english merchants are definitely a, a disadvantage in those encounters um and if they don't bring the individuals back then it, it really impedes trade you know the the people are like well what have you done with them you've got to bring them home or we're not going to talk to you kind of thing you know it, it, it's definitely uh yeah really interesting um i can't remember what i was going to say about well, it well that's interesting mean, because it's certainly the museum and the african museum in liverpool actually talks about that narrative and it's quite interesting that it hasn't changed because you know if you think of us um you know western nations and war-torn regions we get um local people to help us with interpretation but when we're ready to leave the area we don't necessarily help them in any way and I, and some of the narratives that you you'll see in that museum talks a bit about people who actually acted as interpreters but they didn't get any real benefit from them it's not like you suddenly were allowed to move to you know london and, and made loads of money of it you could actually just get left you know <laughs> Um, somewhere so it was it was uh 
that so some things just don't change. Um, Carol Hughes has has a, a question. Um, Carol is quite detailed. Do you want to frame your your question? Yeah, I'm I'm reading it now. Okay. I see it. Um, European presence in Africa in the 1400s and 1500s. Uh, European forts. Um, Sorry, did you want to say? Anything? Yeah, shall I read it aloud just just for people who may not be able to see it? So um, the question is, have you considered research in the reverse? European presence in Africa, 1400s to 1500s. There were many European forts along Ghana, Gold Coast, Dutch, Swedish, Danish, Portuguese. This research may throw up the links to black presence going back to those nations, but also unearth the information and experiences of the Ghanaians to this white European presence. Benin artisans depict the Europeans they encountered in their bronze plates and artifacts. And there's a new major museum that will feature this history due to opening the next few years. Is that a museum in, in Ghana that she means? Maybe she can type the answer. Fair. But, but yeah, that I mean, that work is, is being done. Um, uh, there's, uh, there's a book by someone called David Northrup called Africa's Discovery of Europe that does sort of tell the story from that other angle to some extent. Um, Olivet Otelli's book, uh, I haven't got that to hand. Anyway, Olivet Otelli's latest book is called African Europeans, um, which I think has some material pertinent to that as well. I think, I think one of the things that your question raises that I think is really important as well that some people don't realise is that you know, when by the time the English get to Africa, you know, they are not the first Europeans there by any means. And again, some of these these uh, encounters that I was just talking about with these merchants, you know, the, the Portuguese are a very strong presence in those areas on the mm -hmm. Gold Coast and, and broad, more broadly across West Africa, you know, with uh, places like Elmina Castle being one of their sort of first and most prominent um forts and and they are oh of course yeah toby as michael is putting in the chat toby green of course uh, a fistful of shells about west africa um is a really yeah yeah i don't if you can all see the chat but michael is very helpfully <laughs> pasting some of those reading recommendations there um so i think i think yeah i think that you know, the research you know, has been is being done in reverse and there is some really interesting work on um, the African presence in some of those countries as well, um, which uh, you know I can direct you to if you want if you if, any, if you want me to to send you things later or you know some of it's re referred to in my book. So uh, you know the the Dutch Portuguese stuff, the Dutch stuff I talk about in the I think the Spanish and Portuguese stuff I talk about in conjunction with John Blank and then the Dutch stuff I talk about in conjunction with Reasonable Blackman because as a silk weaver he might have come to London from Antwerp. Uh, but um, yeah, so so um, Dienka Hondius uh, has done some work on Africans in in Holland. Um, and yeah, I mean, yeah, so, so yes, but uh, yeah, I think I think that, uh, yeah, it's important to say that, you know, the black Tudors are not unique in Europe. There are, you know, Spain and Portugal particularly have much stronger relationships with Africa, certainly, you know, from, the, like you said, from the 1400s. And so there's a much larger black presence in Spain and Portugal than there, and to a lesser extent, Italy, than there is in Northern Europe. Uh, but then those Northern European countries, I think, have similar stories to, to Britain in terms of how Africans begin to arrive there as well. Okay. Ella, do you have any um, other questions that have come through on the forums? Yes, I have a couple. Um, okay. And I think uh, a couple of them relate into to perhaps some answers you've already given, but maybe um, you could explore them a little bit. Uh, so um, Naomi's also asked, what primary evidence did you use and where did you source some of the material? And I notice you've talked about the closure of archives as being quite a, a bane of your life, but uh, perhaps you could explore that a bit more with us. Yeah, I mean, it's something that I talked about a bit at the beginning of uh, the recorded lecture. Um, but like I said, um, a lot of the bulk of the numbers that we have to kind of demonstrate um, the black presence in Tudor 
uh, England uh, come from parish registers, so baptisms, marriages and burials, uh, which tend to be kept in county record offices. So all the ones for Devon are in Exeter and all the ones for Cornwall are in Truro and all the ones for uh, Dorset are in Dorchester uh, and so on. Um, so I did go on a few road trips back in the joyous summer of 2007, uh, <laughs> long, long ago. Uh, and literally was sort of reading through these parish registers, um, looking for longer sentences, um, because your standard entry might say John, son of John Smith, was baptised today. Uh, but if there was someone of African origin, it would have to be a longer sentence because it would have those ethnic descriptors in the line. So it would be John, a blackamoor was baptized or John son of John a Blackamoor was baptized or you know this sort of thing so 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 there was a lot of uh, legwork there um which you would think would have been simplified by now in terms of because I, I mean you're saying the archives are shut but more and more things are available online and have been digitized but the problem with that kind of research is that you know I, I'm kind of constantly on ancestry and find my past now with the new book trying to sort of trace some of these family links um but because the information I'm looking for is those ethnic descriptors. Um, Blackamoor was the most common word used to describe Africans in this time, but uh, I'm also looking for words like Ethiop, um, uh, you know, and, and words that are now now you know offensive and you but you know, like like Negro or, or um, they 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 don't spell the like the N word as it later becomes spelt, but there is a word N E G A R. Um, as well that, that comes up so there are various there are various um words that i look for and it, it's very important to me that those words are there because um other uh, scholars have tried you know identified as black people who i'm not sure we can definitively say were uh, by talking about you know just a surname uh as opposed to a descriptor um or or other other indications and even the word black itself uh, didn't actually tend to mean what we might mean somebody of African origin at the time it was usually used to describe someone's hair colour or kind of general colouring but um, uh, so there are some false friends there as well um, uh, so yes yeah, so I was saying that ancestry and find my past you can't really search them for those kind of descripting descriptive words and I'd, I'd add that it's not just Africans who are described by their ethnicity in in these records you know I found references to French people and Portuguese people and Spanish people and Huguenots and you know all of that is in the in the uh in those archives as well um and you know but there are a lot of different um categories uh of of archive that I looked at beyond beyond parish registers and you can quite you can sometimes get more detail on some of them um all of this is in my thesis in the appendix which is now available online which I, I can send put a link in the chat to if you like but um you know household records of payments made for servants wages or buying uh, clothes and shoes and things like that that things come up there uh, uh, uh the, there's a uh, court i mean the court cases there's letters and diaries um you know um municipal accounts but um, I think court cases like the High Court of Admiralty, the Star Chamber records uh, is where it's a lot more um, haphazard as to how to find these cases. But if you can find these cases, you get a lot more meat on the bones of the story if it's a court case, because uh, there are long depositions, people are arguing about things, there's something of a story to it. Um, so there are a few, a few, quite a few of the chapters in the book are based on individuals who get caught up as witnesses, usually in sort of some kind of court case. And, and that's where those stories come out uh, and, and Diego uh, the circumnavigator who traveled with Francis Drake I mean a lot of the story we have about him comes from voyage accounts uh, and even sort of Spanish records as well where the, the Spanish authorities in South America are writing back to Madrid saying we're in trouble Drake is you know troubling us um, and uh, uh, yeah so so there's really a wide range of sources but obviously I didn't read every single early modern document that survives and so that's why I was saying that um the uh that there's more to find no I'm just putting it in the chat this is a link to where you can find my thesis uh which has you know all these records and the different types of discussion of these different sources as well um 
it's, 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 I mean, that's that's a, a question I'm curious about. It's like how do how do you know when you've exhausted? you know, um, you know, just your, your cross checking, because I can imagine, I, I mean, I, I hear what you're saying that you, you know, you take the, it, it so far and you hope that other people will pick up and do further research, but before one goes off and, and publishes a book, you know, how do you know that you've, you've exhausted all of the, you know, the, the checks, the cross checks to make sure that you're actually telling an authentic tale? Um, I uh, well, I think I think that um, in terms of the archives I looked through, uh, the I, I I I specifically I haven't read every parish register in the country, but I specifically targeted southern coastal counties and cities. Uh, you know, so I read everything in Bristol that was, remains in Bristol, Southampton, Plymouth, uh, Truro, um, Exeter uh um, london um you know so so if you think about it what we do know is this that africans would have arrived by ship and um so it makes more sense that that you know, and also you know that the records that i you know that that the, that the black and asian studies association had already collected before by the time i did my uh field work um and they they you know they gave an indicative you know, uh, you know, of the sorts of parishes and areas that they'd already found references in. And then I would go to that parish, uh, to that area and read through the entire parish register and some and you and come up with more more references. Um, and, you know, like I said, other other scholars have been working in the field as well. So Imtiaz Habib published his book Black Lives in the English Archives in 2008. Uh, which also, you know, after, so I was sort of four years into my thesis. I probably should have finished my thesis by then, but I hadn't. Um, but uh, I'd, I'd kind of done a lot of my primary research by that point, but then he published and he his book has a long index of the, the records that he was aware of. Uh, and so I cross-referenced mine with his. Um, and again, disagreed with him on a few things, but, um, you yeah, know, that, that, so I found things in his that uh, that I hadn't found before, but then... Uh, I had found things that he hadn't found. And then Onyeka published his book in 2013, his first book. Uh, and again, there was, you know, there was a lot of overlap and then there were there were new things to me. Uh, so I think that that was, uh, I guess that that was that was useful um, to be able to compare what I'd found with what they'd found to sort of see. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, but you that's the thing with research. I mean, I, I suppose I could have spent the rest of my life trying to read every single early modern document that survived. But um, I think I, I think I gathered enough evidence to build a, a case in my thesis to, uh, and convince myself of my arguments and hopefully other people. Um, and, uh, you know, that was I felt that, yeah, there was a story to tell. Excellent. Ella? Yeah, just to pick up on that point, I think it's quite an interesting um, discussion around the research process, you know, and how it's, um, you know, I think uh, a conversation that goes on between researchers and quite often, sometimes that's in public it, through books and publishing um, and, and articles. So uh, I, I found that quite fascinating. Um, just to kind of um, pick up on some of the questions again that have come in through the form. So thank you. Keep submitting them. Um, uh, Eric has asked about um, in your your writing. You mentioned mixed marriages, mixed race marriages between uh, Europeans and Africans, um, and she's asking if there's any kind of um, any kind of uh, how their their kind of mixed race children were viewed at the time, and anything you've picked up on that that front in your research yeah um not a lot i mean I, I i i think that's an element that could definitely be explored more and um i uh when i when i was sort of um when i was including people in my um in my uh, uh my my database um I definitely I included people who were described as a child of a blackamoor as well as so 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 some of the individuals in the database are of African origin but they might have um, mixed parentage um, and, and I think that wasn't a sort of a theme that I spent a lot of time thinking about at the time but it might be something that would be worth um, exploring further I didn't 
so it was interesting in that way that they didn't have necessarily a vocabulary of the sort that was sort of emerged later or in different countries of the kind of you new know, words like um mulatto or or the kind of much more nuanced um sort of layers of different words that the Spaniards developed to talk about different mixes of people as to whether they had one black parent or one black grandparent or you know all sorts of uh, uh, a kind of racial hierarchy that was developed but um, in the records I was looking at you were more likely to I think the word mulatto is only used a couple of times and uh, it, you would more, yeah, that that ethnicity would have been like, indicated more with a phrase like "son of a Blackamoor," "son of Elizabeth the Blackamoor," or, or something like a phrase like that. Uh, so the ethnic descriptor is still attached to the parent rather than the child. Um, uh, but I, yeah, I didn't find a huge amount about how they were perceived. But I did, there was some interesting uh, kind of, um, I suppose, bio, biological speculations in terms of you were learning a bit more about early modern medicine and how how they understood reproduction to take place because um, the, I, I think there was one parish register where it said the son of a blackamoor born white which obviously confused them is it well it felt like it confused them um, and uh, there was uh, another story where um, a baby was found abandoned in Somerset Yard so just outside Somerset House uh, in central Lo in London uh, which was at that point a palace uh, belonging well originally built for the Duke of Somerset um, I think but but uh, but the, so they found this baby abandoned and when they wrote it down they said the father supposed to be a blackamoor they didn't say the mother's supposed to be a black and white. So, but but they they said the father, even though they they knew nothing about this baby except what it looked like. And so, when I was puzzling over that, I kind of learned that um, the medical theory at the time hadn't really evolved much since Galen in I think fourth century BC Greece, which and the the conception was that um, the father's seed provided all the information about what the child was going to be like and that the mother was only pro providing the clay so to, to sort of but the design all came from from the man's side so so that's what kind of is but that's the kind of under misunderstanding of, of of the reproductive process that leads to that kind of conclusion interesting <laughs> you know, and there's there is you know there's another guy who said you know i have known you know i've known a a, a black a man uh you know a, a come come to england take an english woman to life and to wife and uh wife and life uh you know and produce a child as black as coal or as black as the no it was i, I he describes the father as as black as coal and he says and the the child was as black as the father so they're they're still puzzling through that like they're still trying to understand how does that happen? You know, what does how does that work? And they're sort of speculating about, uh, yeah, skin colour and what causes skin colour. And um, yeah, looking again, like to, as to go back to an earlier question of, you know, trans, you know, translating travel narratives and things where it becomes clear that, uh, you know, white people have gone to Africa and had children with people in Africa, and those children have come out a different colour again, and they're they're sort of trying to figure that out. Um, you know, and they're having old, you know, the older theories about, um, you know, the word Ethiop in Greek originally means burnt face. And, the, you know, that comes of a kind of line of thinking that, that, that Africans have dark skin because they have been too close to the sun. You know, it's hotter there. Um, but then they, you know, when they discover the new world and they find uh, Native Americans who live at a similar latitude, uh, but look completely different, then that's kind of slightly scuppers that theory. Um, so, so yeah, it's a period of of trying to understand those those things. Well, I think linked to the question of vocabulary, uh, Catherine Hoare lists um, that she's interested in hearing about the voc vocabulary you choose to use in your work and the vocabulary you encountered in the work of others. Catherine, I don't know if you want to try to um, unpick that for us. Hello. Um, yes, I was just very interested because vocabulary and particularly the contemporary vocabulary that we used as opposed to the historical vocabulary which we encounter in collections, archives and often inscribed on objects and pictures. 
um, is something which we're wrestling with at the moment in terms of what is the most appropriate way to speak of people in the past um and it's it's i was just interested when you were writing your book which words you chose as your standard and constant sort of identifiers or 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 place markers so to speak for for, for the reader yeah were you were you here at the like earlier at, towards the beginning of the session where i was talking about language uh, no i came in a little bit later i heard when you were talking about the language that was in the archives um and what you were saying about uh, words such as 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 blackamoor and the fact that they haven't got all they're not using the same vocabulary that we use nowadays um which i agree that's very much what i find when i'm looking at our objects and some of the objects actually have inscribed on them words which it's then quite difficult when you're putting those images out into the public domain because you're aware that they're not words that we would use nowadays. Do you, do you work at a museum? Have I seen yes, you I, tweeting I, recently? Yes, yeah. yes I do work. I work at the what, British Museum. I've been at the British tweeting, Museum. Yeah, yeah I've been tweeting for Black History Month so this is this is very much something I've been um, wrestling with in terms of, of get, getting the tone white right <laughs> getting it white well that's <laughs> that's white and right <laughs> I, I am i am very aware that as a as a white historian and a white educator i have to continually challenge sections of what i think is acceptable and i'll think oh that's acceptable and then i'll show it to a to a friend of mine and um, who has African black heritage and they'll go why have you used that and I'm just very aware that I can't make assumptions myself yeah no it's interesting I mean because we all know what happened to the British Museum curator in Black Panther um, yes. I, think, I think that's a fate, a fate you know um <laughs> white women looking at black history have to uh, strive to avoid um and and but you know she wasn't very humble was she uh, <laughs> i think um it's yeah it's difficult i was talking earlier about sort of the word enslaved and trying to use that you know talk about enslaved and enslavers and enslaved people i think sometimes i mean uh, but i think it's an evolving vocabulary that we're trying to create to try and be more sensitive and try not to try not to sort of perpetrate the crime again by just uh, echo it parroting the words that were used at the time which had so much uh pain and and kind of racist you know the racist thought that they embodied the that sort of racist worldview and i I've, I've you know we've got a long way to go with this and i think it's about being open to the conversation and um you know everyone you talk to is going to have a different view and a different idea of what they consider to be acceptable what they consider to be offensive uh, and it's getting more and more fraught in the current political climate um, I don't know if you saw um, a few weeks ago, uh, Lucy Worsley used the N-word in a documentary when she was quoting from a directly from a source uh, and it blew up uh, you know, really very badly. For, you know, it, and especially uh, you know, because it was the same week that uh, the, the N-word had been used in a BBC News broad broadcast about a racially most motivated attack in, I think, in Bristol. and um, yeah, this word, these words have always been offensive, but the you know the heightened feelings at present, you know, completely understandable heightened feelings just made it even more of a powder keg. And I think we do, I think you know, I, I would love to see a kind of really diverse group of people workshop it and try and come up with a properly thought through like new vocabulary. Like we're humans, yeah. we create new words every day. Like every year the Oxford English Dictionary um you know adds several neologisms. So let's use our um ingenuity and come up with a better language and you know circulate it. Um because there are a lot of problems sort of embedded in our in our language and I think yeah we need to challenge them. I mean in terms of the book you know, I wrote it quite a long time ago now, in a way. Um, and so I think some of the 
words that I used in it then I might not use if I sat down and wrote it again now but I, I'm sure I used the word slave fairly indiscriminately in there okay. uh, I can't remember off the top of my head uh, and you know I've also been picked up you know there is there's a there's a slight problem it can be problematic when you're trying to re write something that's readable for the general reader and you don't want to sort of ob you know confuse them with not to sort of underestimate their intelligence, but not you want the words to flow and you don't want to be kind of using four words when one might do and it, it can get tricky or you don't want to use the same word every single time because you need to vary the language just to make it readable. Uh, and so I think I probably did end up using black and African interchangeably, whereas of course they aren't really. Uh, mm. you know, it, uh, and it, of course, you know, the, but well, both terms are very, uh, you know, be problematic. <laughs> and I think that the, you know, particularly the word black, I mean, I've sat, I can't tell you how many meetings or workshops or events I've sat in where we all we do is talk about what black really means and who it yeah. isn't. And, you know, and I think then we have all these really unfortunate acronyms now of BME and BAME and what do they oh, mean? Let's not let's not go down that route. So I'm mindful that we've got about eight more eight more minutes. I did not Ella tells me that we've in my book. But yeah. I wanted to say on black versus African that in the thesis in my thesis, the title of the thesis was Africans. And I used my my kind of scope was the African continent so there are you know, Mary there are people from Morocco in the book uh, and I've had that dialogue with with people and you know and obviously people you know North Africans have lighter skin than than, than sub-Saharan Africans and obviously a whole kind of range of shades in between around Africa is a huge huge place you know much bigger than the whole of Europe and uh, half of Asia put together or something there's a great map where they sort of fit all the continents into it but um, uh, so, so that I mean I think the title Black Tudors again you know it's uh, to some extent it's a, a kind of mark they're a marketing um, yeah it's more for wider that. public consumption okay I'm just going to move us on I mean I, that's that's a really rich I mean when you start talking about language and how how things people are described is it, it, it is you could go on for a while. Ella, you've got a couple of more questions, and I also know that there's a, another question in the chat. So let's see if we can we can get those in in our next six minutes. <laughs> no pressure, but your minute starts now. Um, there, there's a question here about how did you find the information on the black trumpeter um, who worked for Henry V? Uh, well, quickly, um, you know, if, if we've got only six minutes, um, have a look at the entry on him in the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography and my footnotes for the chapter. But um, I, he was a figure that was already known, you know, amongst Black British history scholars, certainly, you know, for, for a long time. Um, but I've, you know, again, I kind of took what was already known and then uh, tried to find out more. And um you know, I very systematically kind of tried to go through uh, the royal records and find all the payments that have been made to him, uh, uh, for example. So then I, so I found more details. So I found, uh, you know, the evidence that he played at Henry VII's funeral and Henry VIII's coronation um, because there were records of him being bought black funeral clothes and scarlet celebratory coronation clothes um, in the royal treasury. And the most, I mean, the most exciting thing I think that I, it's not that I found it, but I put it together because musical, there's a whole, you know, a lot of history, there's like a lot of silos which don't speak <laughs> to each other. So um, historians of early, early modern music had done a lot of work into court musicians in general across Europe and there's a whole biographical kind of uh, encyclopedia of the you know, dictionary of them you know that goes to many volumes and they they had an entry on John Blank but it took me quite a long time to sort of get as far as finding that and it was through a kind of note reading through that that I then found this reference to his petition for a pay rise that is successful and uh you know, it was really exciting and I found it and I told my colleague Michael Hajiru, who I think is with us, uh, about it and he happened to be in the National Archives that day and he managed to get in there and photograph it for me and then I transcribed it and then, you know, 
it, we, we discovered that he'd been quite a kind of canny operator and uh, had made Henry a, an offer he couldn't refuse. So, so it, it, you know, it was, I think, the biographical approach, for the, and that was stuff I found out while researching the book rather than during my thesis. So I think the biographical approach really helped in that I, I was able to drill deeper. I was able to dig deeper while for, when I was focusing on one individual as opposed to trying to marshal conclusions from kind of 300 plus individuals uh you know I was able to drill down and find out more information than had hitherto been discovered I think that's um that's quite fascinating really um in terms of kind of I think he was an early sort of advocate for um equality and pay <laughs> so good on him um the, the other question I've got here is um it may not be a quick one but maybe it will be um so your book focuses on 10 um sort of stories core cool stories are there any uh, kind of um people that you kind of read about in your research that you would have liked to have known more about or include in that book well, i'd like to know more about all of them <laughs> um yeah i mean like you said you will very often get very tantalizing glimpses of people uh there's there's this one guy that um luckily someone else has picked up on and, and found out more about so uh there was a man called harry domingo in aberdeen in the early 17th century and i had just come across some references to him being paid for playing the trumpet or for uh, sort of running errands for the for the well the the, the council essentially there uh, but um this uh historian called i think uh, i think she's called catherine mcmanus is still researching but has found evidence that he was an adulterous highwayman so so he appears in uh you know in the court in some court cases up there first for his adultery and then for his or even bigamy i think anyway and then and then for uh a, a, you know attacking people on the highway and he i think he gets executed so uh so there's a whole story there i mean that would have made a great chapter wouldn't it but um i hope that um she'll write that up and publish it soon because that that's great and and you know i think uh yeah i mean henry jetto um is a really interesting figure as well um uh yeah the the one who was uh originally i think a, you know a gardener in the household of is it sir henry bromley in worcestershire and then he's the one who's got the modern descendant that we know of um and you know, he starts out as a gardener and then he uh becomes uh independent and marries twice and has no am i i I think I'm conflating two individuals now. But anyway, yeah, there are loads of other people that it would be great to know more about. But at the moment, it's not, you know, we don't. But you, we won't, who, I, I hope that others find more. Okay, great. So I think I think we have time for one more because we were looking to wrap up for five o'clock. Um, so we have time one for one more question, if anyone, or Ella, if you've got one on the form or... Well, there's one more in the chat that I can see. So um, okay. Phil, Phil's asked, uh, what, what, what is your motivation um, for uncovering lost or deliberately not told uh, histories of certain people? Uh, well, I mean, I would say that um, I want to find the truth. Um, but I, I mean, I think I sort of touched on some of this earlier. I think Carol Hughes's next question, a little bit lower down, looks a bit more like something a bit different. I'm not quite sure what she's. Yeah. I think she's responding yeah. to Catherine's um, uh, okay. earlier comments. Oh, okay. All right. Um, yeah. Well, I, I well, I think you, you want to find lost histories because they're fascinating. We didn't know about them, and we need them in order to tell the full story. So, what 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 advice would you give for um, you know sort of budding researchers and historians? I mean, because it you know it's quite you know, again, you have to have that natural curiosity. Um, it sounds like you have to be quite detail oriented and meticulous. What 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 else what else would would a, a, an early career researcher need to know to embark on, you know, un, unearthing the truth of stories that have not been told or asking questions that hadn't been asked before? Uh, yeah, don't take no for an answer. <laughs> the first time I went to the National Archives, they told me I wouldn't find anything there. Uh, I think um, uh, 
I think, yeah, don't be afraid to ask for help. Um, if there's somebody working in a field that you're interested in, like approach them, you know, call me. <laughs> but like, you know, talk talk to people, you know, have an open mind, start with one question and you don't know where it's going to lead. Uh, and, um, but, you, you know, also try and get a grounding on, you know, there's an awful lot you can find online now in terms of um, search engines, digitised sources, um, British History Online has got a lot of calendars of stuff. You know, there's a lot of stuff there that I had to sort of look at the original um, printed books and look at the indexes, which now you can do a word search for. Uh, you know, the state papers are online, the colonial state papers are online. Um, you know, there, there's there's a lot of stuff that has been digitised. Sometimes it's behind paywalls. Um, but you should be able to access it at the British Library or the National Archives if they're ever open again or through any kind of university log on. Um, yeah. And I mean, yeah, talk, talk, talk to talk to people and, find, you know, keep your eyes open. And uh, I think most researchers probably have a sort of back. A burner of like five other projects that they haven't had time to do so they'd probably be more than happy to supervise you and sort of guide you as to where where to go with it I've often had thought there ought to be a, a kind of website sort of almost a matchmaking website but for research and researchers so you know for example I was looking at when I looked at these parish registers I found this record of a a uh, a man who could speak getting married he appeared, said he appeared at the church with his bride in one hand and a bible in the other and made signs to show that he wished to be married and you know it turns out this is sort of the first record of sort of british sign language or something uh so so you know but that could be an amazing project you know you, you're kind of looking in archives and you find something you're like well that's interesting but i don't it's not what i'm looking for and it you know it's something else so it'd be great if if every time anyone found anything like that, they could just upload it somewhere with a reference and sort of in a topic area or something, and then people could get on there and find find more. But okay, yeah, I mean, and it does beg the question as well because I mean, again, you're looking at um, sort of recorded histories, but there's so much that's not recorded. You think of cultures that have oral histories, how much has been lost? I mean, certainly within my uh, family elders you know I you know we always used to sit down and try to have conversations with elders because there's so much that that wasn't written down and you know how do you how do you capture that um because just 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 like with you know sort of AI if you're using existing data sets you might continue to get the same sort of outcomes so it's almost finding different data sets I'm not sure how one does that it's just it's just, no, I it's think just, that's really important and I think that's where Toby Green's book is really amazing because he has gone beyond I suppose I have inhabited the kind of written manuscript kind of world in terms of my research predominantly but in his history of West Africa he has used oral history and archaeology and a whole range of other material culture and a whole range of other sources alongside the manuscript sources and I think you know obviously that's very valuable and as you say you know, I think I think one of the other things that comes up in discussion a lot is, you know, how you know, kind of how do we avoid reproducing the worldview of the white men who mostly write all this stuff? Exactly. Yeah. And who've written this stuff down. Uh, and, and there's a lot of kind of, you know, I have, you know, I'm still, you know, still in the process of, you know, training my brain to try and read against the grain, read backwards through the source. Um, yeah, which, you know, and there's there's a really interesting book about um, women in Barbados that um, has done that um, starting, you know, with fragments of writing, but then kind of building the world around it. Um, mm -hmm. The book escapes me at this precise moment. But, um, OK, thank you very much. Uh, this, well, this has been really, really interesting. And also, you know, we could spend probably another hour just talking about just the process of research as well for those people who are new to it. So perhaps that's a conversation for another time. Um, Ella is saying just to highlight the work that our archivists here at at UEL, Paul Dubman has been doing about archiving and oral histories. So there's more data there. Um, I just really want to thank you, Miranda, for, you know, sort of your your time today and also just your your honest account of the work. And it's it has been stimulating. And I'm hoping that there are people on the call who might um, want to pick up the gauntlet and, and start to do their own sorts of research. So 
I will join, I think let's join Catherine in that sort of applause. You can have the, if you can unmute and do an applause. And I, again, thank you, thank you very, very much. Um, and I think that'll conclude our event for today. Thank you all. Well, no, thank you. It was really interesting. And uh, yeah, I really enjoyed it. It was really stimulating conversation. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you very much. Yeah, okay. and please do, please do get in touch if you want any of you want to talk more about any of this. Um, I'm on Twitter at Miranda Kaufman or my website's www.mirandakaufman.com. All my contact details are on there. And my, yeah. Lovely. I'm sure you're going to get a few followers now. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you very, very much.